All right, welcome back to the radio, and there he is, the count. I got, we got to get the count back on here so bad. I missed the count. But I know yeah, our absolutely. next guest, I have a feeling our next guest doesn't miss him because he's out there in Vegas, and he probably sees him all the time. Let's welcome our good friend, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Mr. Eric Stacy, back to Totally Driven Radio. What's going on there, Eric? Hey, man, what's going on, Bay? Another day in Vegas here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how how often do you actually see the Count? Um, you know, him and his wife do vamp, so uh, see him around quite often. You know, go over to the go over to vamp. Um, his band plays Wednesday nights. I think they got like a regular gig there weekly on Wednesday okay. nights, Count 77. And they got some. He's got some rocking dudes in the band. Stony Curtis, yeah. an amazing guitar player, and um, John Zito, and very great bass player. So yeah, you know, he, he makes the scene to all the stuff, and um, he's got an amazing studio over there where uh, I rehearse with a lot of the bands I do, and um, shoot videos over there. He's got a green screen, and uh, so yeah, he's definitely you know a big part of the scene for sure. That's awesome. Cool guy. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, man. Cool. So, uh, like, you know, it's funny. I, you, I don't think it's even been two months since the last time you were on. And, like, <laughs> so much has changed in two months. <laughs> right? Yeah. The, the drama of rock and roll, man. You know? <laughs> Uh, which I, I, and I want to say thank you first off. Like, you know, me, me and Eric have had some like really great conversations over the last few months, and um, uh, your your compliments and your words uh, that you've said to me. I, I, I mean, I can't thank you much. I can't tell you truly like how much it means for me being the fanboy who truly looked up to you, you know, in the eighties and early nineties, and, and how much it truly means to me. So I can never thank you enough for those words. Well, thanks, man. I mean, that means a lot. You know, I, I, you know, there's, I've done a lot of interviews in my life and, you know, there's, there's certain people you do interviews with that just, you know, they come prepared, they've done their research, they, and they're, and they're just really great fans of rock and roll, you know, and it's a pleasure to talk to them. And then you get these people that you talk to where it's like, shit, you know, let's get through this. They, you know, (laughs) they obviously are just doing it because it's a job or whatever. And, and, you know, you, with you, it's like you just feel like, you know, you're just talking to a friend who's just another fellow big fan of rock and roll because that's all I am really at heart. So it's nice to talk to you, man. You know, it's a ple- it's always a pleasure, hey, even our, our off-air conversations, you know, we talk right. a lot. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, and it's funny because the way you say that is, and before I even hit you up uh, for the first time to come on the show, I used to say to myself all the time about you being just a music fan, because if you're friends with Eric on Facebook, he's always posting like the coolest rock stuff, like, you know, like some classic stones or Hanoi rocks or whatever it may be. And I'm, and I just sit back and I'm like, that's just, it's awesome to see somebody who's had success like Eric still is truly a fan at heart as well. I appreciate that, man. You know, I mean, I try to, I mean, that's, I try to stay, you know, grounded and just, that's all I am. I'm just a fan like everybody else. It's good rock and roll. And, you know, I mean, I try to, you know, I've always tried to just keep a level head. I mean, even when Faster was doing really well, I mean, I always tried to stay humble. And, you know, if somebody wanted to talk or an autograph or whatever or a picture, I just always tried to make the time because, I mean, I wouldn't be shit without, you know, without the fan support and people buying the records and stuff. And I, I know that. So, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, it's an awesome job to have, but it's, it's another, it's another job. It's another living. So, you know, if you're, if you're fucked to the people who help you on the way up, you, you know, you got to reexamine your head, man, you know, as far as I'm Absolutely. Concerned, so. yeah. So, so um, yeah, man. you you, uh, you dropped the bomb last week, and uh, you know, Eric came to me a couple weeks ago and said, you know, he's going to be putting out this big press release, and um, he can't tell me about what it is or what's going on. Um, and then uh, once the press release came out, you know, he, he sent me the press release uh, and uh, told me what it was, and uh, he booked to come on tonight. And um, it, the big thing was he, he was playing in this band uh, called Angels in Vain, which uh, – really 
uh, I guess the way to put it, like last time you were here, you were so excited, uh, not only about the band itself, but the response you guys were getting from around the world by the fans. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, what you say is true. It's fact. I, you know, I was excited and, um, you know, there was a lot of reasons to be excited and, um, you know, without beating a dead horse because the press release has come out and I don't want people to go, Oh, he's saying the same shit over and over. Um, I'm not trying to do that. But, you know, um, I did tell you I was going to come on, and, and at least t- that was one of the things we were going to talk about. So, and obviously, you know, people want to know what happened. And I think that's the reason that I put out a state in the first place is, you know, if you leave a band and you just leave, and you just leave the blanks for somebody else to fill in, that's what they're going to do. They're just going to fill them in with suppositions, innuendo, rumor. So it's better to just go, hey, you know, I'm leaving. This is why I'm leaving. And let me just say, I mean, every, everything, everything that I said in that press release, I can very easily back up. Not that I want to get into a pissing match or anything like that, but it's all, it all happened, and, and it's very easy. I mean, I've got copies of contracts and conversations, and, and I don't want to get into any of that or n- mention names, but oftentimes, you know, looking at something from the outside, looking in, everything looks, you know, like everything's going great and everything looks great and, 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 and it was to an extent, but from the inside looking out, sometimes there's a lot of stuff, you know, people don't see. And again, without beating a dead horse, what I will say is that, um, you know, from the, from the very beginning, and I've already said this, I just wanted an equal band where everybody had equal shares at the table and everybody had a say in what was going on. And when it didn't become that, and it went on like that for some period of time over and over and over. I still tried to stay a team player. I mean, you know, like I said, the specifics have already been put out there, but, you know, when you say to somebody, hey, uh, you know, I want this to be a band, let's re-record demos as a band and make it a band thing, and it's, you know, it's shot down, and then, you know, and then you find out T-shirts are on sale when they actually go on sale, and you're never like, no one ever says, hey, we're going to put shirts on sale, what do you think? Let's go over the design. You know, you're never shown sales figures. You're never told how many singles are sold. When things go on like that over and over, and I and I still kept trying to be a team player, you know. I mean, there were times I'd bring things up and they would just, whatever, just not get attended to or whatever, you know, or, or bring up, what, you know, we need to sign a contract, making this an equal share. Oh, yeah, you know, I want to do that too. And then it just goes, you know, nothing happens and, when it goes on for a certain amount of time, you know, one of the things about being a band is like, you know, I was talking to Brent Muscat the other day about this. It's like, look, you know, we've done a certain amount of work in our lives. We, you know, me and Tammy and Greg and Brent worked our asses off to get faster pussy cat where, where it got to. And we learned right. a lot of lessons, you know, and, and some the hard way. I mean, we were sued for $195,000 by Winterland after the band broke up and, because it wasn't a corporation and it was a partnership, we were all liable for that money. And so there's certain lessons and some of them like that one, unfortunately you learn the hard way. But the point is, you know, you, you go through enough stuff and you do enough in your career that you feel like you at least deserve, you know, to be heard. It's like, Hey, sure. you know, learn these lessons. And I, and, and that's all I asked for from the very beginning, honestly, was just, I want this to be a band. I don't want to work for anybody. And, when it gets to be, you know, when it gets to be something that, you know, you, you're, where you're watching decisions being made that affect your future, your career, if you, you know, you have two choices, you either sit there and you let it happen and then you have nobody to blame like a year or two later, or you, you know, you make some tough choices and that's what I had to do. I mean, I tried to be a team player and, and, you know, be positive and there was a lot of cool things that were going on. But at the same time, there was inside, there was just um, things that, you know, the public isn't privy to that just, you can, you know, you can only sit there for so long before you just go, you know, I either write it out and I have nobody to blame or, you know, I learned a long time ago with rock and roll, you create your reality. No one's going to give it to you. You got to go out and work for it and and make your breaks. And so that's, I mean, without going on, that's what I would say is that, I feel like I'm just better off um, 
you know, I'm, I'm, t- I'm talking to somebody and I don't want to mention names yet because it hasn't been that confirmed yet, but, you know, I'm, I'm talking to somebody who is a really great guitar player, singer, and I feel like maybe hopefully with that situation it'll be more of like we're going to sit down and write and it'll be more of our thing and and I think people are going to really hopefully dig it and um, so, you know, I'm certainly not without connections and, and, and friends and support in the business, so... Right. You know, it's not, it's not a, I mean, I don't want to say it's not a big deal to move on, but it's not, it's nothing that I fear or um, am that concerned with, I'll, you know, like, I've, I've, I will say that I've received a lot, a lot, a lot of support and people have reached out to me through this and said, Hey, you know, we're behind you. We know that you're going to come out with something kick ass and, you know, you know, keep, you did what you had to do and keep rocking. So mm. that feels real good. Now, like, with a situation like that, like, I mean, I'm sure you talked to some of the other guys in the band. Like, what were their feelings about it? Like, did they agree with you, or did they just feel like you were wrong, or, like? Well, um, you know, again, without getting into names and stuff, because, you know, some, I mean, it did happen quickly, and it did happen suddenly, and, um I don't even know how to say this, but you know, some people were are are out on tour doing other things, and some people you're not right. in touch with because they're busy. So sure. some people I didn't even really talk to, but I've known a long, long time, and I've um, worked with before, and I, you know, and I just I I know I know certain people as people, so I didn't really have to. There's not much to discuss at that point. You know, you've been in a band right. with these guys, you've been doing what you've been doing. And so it's kind of like, it, you know, the time to the time to sit down and go, look, you know, I'm getting upset with what's going on. Do you care? Do you want to keep it the way it is? Was it, it was kind of past that point. So at, right. at that point, it's kind of like, you know, you just do you do what you got to do. So, um, you know, unfortunately, that's part of being part of a band like Angels of Vain was, where a lot of the guys have other. And that's kind of one of the issues, you know, a lot of the the guys have other commitments. And so as far as the band goes, we, you know, prior to this happening recently, we hadn't all been in the same city together for a month or something due to other commitments wow. by other guys. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, another one of the issues, you know, originally I thought we were going to be on, on the road by the end of September, beginning of October. That's what we had all discussed at one point. And right. that was just another one of the issues that came up where, when it seemed like, well, not seen when it was evident that that wasn't going to happen. It was like, well, that sucks. Cause I was expecting to be out and playing, you know, playing live for the people and making some money. And, right. you know, so you do what you got to do, I suppose, you know, and and, and 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 again, I you know I say all this without. I, I don't want this to be a piston match. You know, I wish all the guys the best. You know, it's their their lives and their careers are their lives and their careers, and my life and my career is mine. And that's you know what it is. Sure. So you know, you know fans. Some fans are going to fall on one side of the line. Some fans are going to fall on the other. And I and, you know, I'm sorry to anybody who. Um, falls on that side where they just aren't happy with what happened or whatever but you know look you know they they i don't i'm sure everybody's in their own business and i don't profess to know about your business and what you do or you know what you do for a living because i don't do that for a living so i don't know shit about it so i'm not going to discuss it (laughs) because i don't know it like you know it so you know that's all a comment about what happened on this side is so you know this this whole situation actually made me think um as I was thinking about it the other day as I was actually driving and like w- when you go into a a band situation like this where you got you know you got five guys who all you know have had prior music careers or whatever you decide to start this project and it's starting to become a band like is there, is there a point or when is there a point that you guys like actually have to sit down and like, all right, music stuff aside, friendships aside, and all, 
how are we going to do this legally and business wise and royalties and merchandise? Like, how how soon does a situation like that come in? Then? Well, you know, every situation is is different, but that's a good question, and that's one of the things that I was really trying to say was. Um, again, without mentioning names or getting into specifics too much, it was, it was, it's been a while now since, you know, it's been, it's been since the end of May that we shot the video. We, we knew we had a good video. We knew, we knew, we obviously saw that what the reaction was. So when you start to see those kinds of things happening, it was, you know, probably a couple months ago that I said to somebody, look, it's time that we need to sit down now and we need right. to, you know, do some kind of informal contract that we all sign that says this is a, you know, there's five guys in the band. This is a 20% equal split amongst everybody. This is an equal thing. And when you're told, you know, when you're told at that time, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm down with that. But then, you know, nothing ever gets done and with, about it and it just kind of gets ignored. And then the facts actually say, say, to the you know i mean it just doesn't play out like that even though that person says they want to do that they're they're doing everything to the contrary it's like you know that's kind of one of the problems you know so for us you know i mean it was you know a couple months ago when we shot the video and we were getting the reaction we were getting and things were being discussed and stuff that i felt like hey you know and you know again this is what i was talking about about you learn certain lessons through life a long time ago, I heard a story, and I and I believe it to be true. I, I honestly do. Um, I haven't fact checked it, but I heard a long time ago that the Black Crows, when they were five guys, just like Angels and Vain were, just starting a band. When when whenever they felt that time was right, they were like at a pizza joint, and they sat down and they looked. They took a paper plate, and they split it up like a pie chart, and they all signed a fifth of it and said, "Look, this is this is our contract. It can be that informal." And when the original, one of the original, this is what I was told. And like I said, I used to hang out with those guys. I mean, I knew Chris and Johnny Colt in the beginning. And, and when Jeff, one of the original guitar players, left for however it went down, my my understanding was that he brought that original paper plate into court and that the judge said, yeah, that's a contract. You guys signed it. So it doesn't have to be some friggin', you know, it doesn't have to be some fucking 50-page uh, document that's gone through a lawyer and you spent 10000 bucks on. It can be as simple as that. And that's really what I had originally said is, look, it's time to sit down and just write out some little small informal thing. Sure. And, uh, you know, it just it, – it was it, – it didn't get done. It was – you know, the request was ignored. And, and that's one of the big contentions that I had was, you know – I just don't feel comfortable moving ahead if we're not going to do something like this, you know. So, no. Yeah. That's what. Now, how are like how are you, um, like after all this, like mentally and emotionally, like, I mean, this is something that you really were excited about. I mean, your heart was so into it, and was so exciting, and all of a sudden now it's like gone. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, and you're right. I mean, it's nice of you to consider that because I don't think everybody does some, you know, some people may just go, well, you know, fuck, that was kind of whatever of him, but you know, yeah, man, you know, uh, like I said, I mean, I, I don't, I honestly, at the end of the day, I can take an honest self-assessment of myself and I don't think I'm somebody that has some huge ego or is walking around like a fucking dickhead. I think I'm a pretty easy guy to get along with. I'm very mellow. And, you know, so I was a, you know, trying to be a team player and hanging in there past certain points, well beyond certain points, trying to be a team player. And, and you know, some people don't uh, get it, but, yeah, man, I was fucking devastated. I was crushed. I mean, I've put my heart and soul into this thing. And, I, you know, I don't care if it's five months or five years. Anything I do, I do it 110%, you know, because that's right. what you have to do in the music business. And so, yeah, man, this is not an easy thing at all. And it's still not easy, and there's still bullshit going on, and things being said back and forth, and and it's not like, sure. and it's and it's you know it's not it's just not a fucking easy thing. I mean, yeah, it's it's affected me, and it's and it's hurt me in a fucking huge way, you know, and it won't go away tomorrow. I'm sure it'll you know take a while. So, 
I mean, I appreciate you asking that because I don't think some people realize that. But, yeah, you know, it, I mean, I thought, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not something yeah. I enter into or leave lightly. <laughs> yeah. it, you know, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, it's the whole, like, and not, it's not even just pertaining to bands or the music business, but anything in general like that where you got your whole heart in and, and you really truly believe in it. And then on the flip side where you're getting such a positive reaction back from fans and you're like, all right, this is going to like do something. I'm going to be out on the road. I'm going to be working. I'm going to have a, you know some money coming in right on the road. And then all of a sudden it's just like, whoa, like that, <laughs> that went away quick. <laughs> Yeah, man. I mean, that's again. You know, you're you're spot on. It's 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 fucking devastating. Because I mean, I I don't care. You know, I don't care what you do for a living. I mean, one of the things that I learned from my dad early on in life, he you know he worked his ass off. He you know he put in friggin' you know twelve fourteen hour days every five six days a week. And you know, one of the things I learned from him is that that work ethic, that drive, and and it's like you know nothing comes easy in life, and you got to work your ass off, and 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 with you know like people used to go you know well what you know what made Faster Pussycat make it? What was all I could say was you know that you had five guys that had tenacious perseverance that weren't going to let anything interrupt them, and even though we fought and there was times where you know there was a lot of bullshit going on and jack daniels bottles being thrown at people and all kinds of shit no matter what you know through 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 drug busts and losing drummers and a lot of heavy shit went down but you know what at the end of the day we still no matter what it was like fucking permabond it was glue and we stuck together and we were glued together and nothing was going to let us you know nothing was going to stop us from doing what we needed to do you know you have to be fucking tenacious right. and rock and roll it's it's a you know it's like i forget what he, that quote that hunter thompson said about the rock and roll business but to like horribly paraphrase it was basically like you know rock and roll is a, a, a hallway a bastion of backstabbing evil filthy people and you've got the bad side of the business <laughs> you know um, right, right, right. horribly paraphrase <laughs> hunter S. thompson but you know <laughs> that's what this business is. I mean, it's, it's great when it's great. It's great, but it's also got a lot of like, you know, there's a lot of backstabbing and there's a lot of, you know, viciousness and, and self-centeredness and egos and a lot of bullshit. And if you don't get a thick skin and, and, and be tenacious, you're going to get chewed up real or real early in the business. So, yeah. Now, how about uh, now, and actually, I wanted to ask this question last time we talked was, um, how was it almost kind of like on the same thing, like on a faster pussycat level, where here's a band that you were part of for many years, you had success with, you know, between selling albums, MTV, you know, the whole nine yards, touring with the biggest bands in the world. Um, and you, that band is still going to the today 30 something years later and you're not part of it how is it for you to be to look and see like Tammy and this new band of pussycat out there playing them songs well you know i mean that's a whole <laughs> that's definitely a whole nother issue but i mean i can definitely answer that honestly i mean and uh, you know i've worked with brent in a lot of bands since faster pussycat we were you know bubbled together we did a, our own version of faster pussycat with todd kern when brent owned the name and brett bradshaw and um we've we've just done a lot of projects together he was the best friend at my wedding he's been my best friend for 36 years so you know i was on his new radio show monday night so we we talk a lot and and um you know there's there's a i mean there's a feeling like um you know and it goes without saying the guys that are doing it now wouldn't be doing it if it if it hadn't been for the hard work and and the things that we got done and got accomplished and right. there is that feeling of like faster pussy cat will always be Tammy Greg Brent myself and you know unfortunately whatever drummer is in the band at the moment but, <laughs> um you know there is that feeling and I'm just being honest in saying that 
having said that, you know, um, I mean, obviously Tammy feels a little bit differently and, and um, has carried on with these other guys. And, and, you know, I mean, I've known Danny, you know, the bass player, I've known Danny Nordel for a long, long time and he's a sweetheart of a guy. And, you know, and I've been friends with him for years, way before he was in Faster Pussycat. So on a personal level, I mean, I love Ace Von Johnson. He's a friggin' sweetheart of a guy. So on a personal level, all those guys are really cool. Um, save for one, but I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, you know, um, but but Tammy certainly knows, you know, how I feel, how Brent feels. and And that is that, you know, if Tammy wanted to do a reunion tomorrow, I think that we'd all try to work things out because there's a lot of fans that we still all hear from constantly that go, Hey, you know, Ooh. faster pussycat will always be you guys and the records and the videos. And there's a lot of people that feel even the sound of the band isn't what it used to be. And, and when we got together in 2007, me and Brent and Brett, so we had like three fifths of the, last original band with some other really talented motherfuckers, Todd Kearns and this guy, Kurt Froelich singing. And we went and did a big sold out tour of Europe with uh, bullet boys and enough enough opening. And we did some shows in America. We had a lot, a lot of really positive response. A lot of people were like, you know what, this is what we remember faster pussycat sounding like. So, you know, and we all did get together last year um, at Irvine Meadows for the cat house reunion and it was like the first time in 23 years that we all got on stage together. And it was, it was a lot of fun. And, you know, I think we all put water under the bridge and buried a lot of the issues and stuff. Um, but, you know, I mean, when you see like Guns N' Roses reuniting and you, you know, you remember that in, in 1987, it, you know, Faster Pussycat and Guns N' Roses toured Europe together on, on both of our first tours of Europe. And it was right. such a friggin' blast, you know, it was so fun, but you see that, after all the bullshit and the bad blood that went on with them for years, when you see something like that, you know, you can't help but think, A, never say never, you know, things can, can always get accomplished and happen if everybody's willing to, you know, come to the table and work things out. And to be honest, you, you know, you also, you also realize that like, man, there's a fuck of a lot of money just sitting there that could be made if, right. you know, we ever did do it right and you know got back together so you know there's there's mixed feelings i mean i've seen the band that is faster pussycat nowadays and and i love tammy i i really do we've worked out our issues and that you know i i always wish him the best and you know i was telling brent on on his show the other night i was like you know once a year i i i, I put the bug in tammy's ear don't you want to go out there and just make a fuckload of money and just have a good time for a while and and you know and, uh, you know, I, if it happens, I think everybody would be down for it. Um, you know, we did a New Year's show, me and Brent and Greg out here in Vegas, and we all had a blast, and it was fun. And we played a bunch of old Faster songs, and so, you know, um, if it happens, I think it would be great. And I know that there's a whole lot of fans that would probably dig it, so... Um, you know, that's, I wonder if, like, that's that's that. he kind of feels now like where he's, you know, he's had this version going for however many years it's been, and almost like he would feel bad if he went back with, you know what I mean? Like, he'd be putting those guys out of work, and... Well, my feeling on that is that you can always, you know, you can always go back to that if you want. You can always go, hey, you know what, I'm going to go do a reunion with these guys for three, four, five, six months, and come back to you guys. There's there's ways of doing everything if you want to do it, um, but you know there's the obvious factors that we're honestly not getting into here, which is, you know, if you're the only original member of a band and you're also the front man and the leader of the band and, and one of the, you know, most visually recognized guys in the band, there's obviously a lot of things perks that come with that. You know, you're the one that gets paid at the end of the day. You decide how much money you're going to make at the end of the day and how much you're going to pay the band because they aren't original members and, you know, he gets paid and pays them. And so there's obviously those things, you know, there was a time where he called it the newly deads and decided to change the name to faster pussycat. And there's right. obviously, um, financial perks that come with that and things like that. So, and I, you know, I, I hope he doesn't get mad at me if he hears that. I'm not saying that's a 
bad thing. I mean, you know, I don't blame him, whatever. You know, he's doing what he's doing, and, and so, you know, all the best to him. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you're going to be honest about things, there's, you know, there's reasons why everything's going on the way it's going on. And, you know, some of them are this reason, some of them are that reason. But, I mean, you know, the, it is what it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, you you had mentioned two things in there that I, I wanted to ask you about. One of them was, um, I, I mean, Faster Pussycat, Faster Pussycat was um, the band that made the Cat House famous worldwide for all of us fans that weren't in L.A. So what were some of the great classic memories of the Cat House? Man, you know, there's so many of them because I'll tell you, one of the first things I remember was the, you know, was, I mean, I, I'll always be an original member of Faster Pussycat, but I wasn't, having said that, I wasn't the first bass player, but I was the bass player that joined the band as a club band and took it from a club band and, and took them through getting a record deal and, and took them to where they were going. But there were a couple guys that played with the band before them. So one of the things I remember hey, about the cast was... Something scary, Eric? I actually huh. have hang. You want to know something scary? I actually have hanging on my wall an autographed uh, album by Mr. Kelly Nichols of uh, Sweet Pain. <laughs> so oh, really? A in the past three. Yeah. Wow. It's funny. It's actually, you did scare me because when you said, I actually have hanging, what I thought you were going to say was like, I actually have hanging on the line, Tammy, who wants to yell at you. Oh. <laughs> or something like that. But, no, uh, I wouldn't do that. I thought, I, was like, I thought you were going there. But um, yeah, you know. Yeah, so Kelly was in the band. You know, he got hit by a car. I, I think I've told this story many times. Vicki Hamilton's told it in her book. I was in a band called Darling Cool that later went on to po- sign with Polygram that she managed, and that's how I got the call to join Faster. But, like, the first night that I ever rehearsed with them, and things went great, and everybody was in a great mood, and it was a Tuesday night, and they're like, hey, man, you know, that was cool, and, and why don't you come with us? We're going to this club that Tammy just opened a couple weeks ago called Cat House. And I'm like never heard of it. What is it? And they're like, yeah, we just opened it a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, Tammy and, and Ricky have this new club and, and you know, it's cool. We, we could drink for free. And I was like, yeah, let's, let's go, you know? And that was like two weeks into the club. And, and, uh, you know, at that, at that night, it was like, you know, maybe like 50 people there. And it was just kind of like this low key, cool place to drink for free and whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, it just started blowing up and becoming more popular as the band became popular. And, you know, we released this, you know, the song cat house on the first record about the club. And, you know, it went from like one week, it was like 50 people and we were there just basically drinking for free. And it was all our friends in LA guns and guns and roses just hanging out. And, you know, like six months later, they're moving venues because the venue's been outgrown and, and, it, and there's a line around the block and everybody wants to be there. And, and, and you, re- you really know the club is something when you walk in and, and you see Steven Tyler and Joe Perry sitting at one of the VIP t- tables and it's like, holy shit, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this little club that we used to use is just a, a place to drink for free. You know, it's like, it just became, like you said, this worldwide huge phenomenon and we kind of, informally were put in position of being like the host, you know? So obviously it was like every Tuesday night, we, you know, we were there. It was, it was like, you know, what else are you going to do on Tuesday night, but go to your own club where you get in free, drink for free. You meet a lot of pretty girls. It's, it's just, you know, it's a blast in every way, shape and form. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it's funny because it, it blew up into this huge thing, but it was like, it was twofold. It was like, as it got bigger, it became like, in one way it was cool because it was so successful, but in another way, it was also the club that you just kind of, you know, would walk into and see Slash throwing up as he rolled down the stairs on his way out towards the sidewalk, and it was just, that was like our local hangout, you know, um, so, it, you know, it, good and bad came with it, but uh I guess another great memory would be the night, obviously, that we filmed our part for uh, the decline at the cat yeah. house, and you know that was like, that was like, okay, you know, we've arrived. We had just gotten back from our first European tour with GNR, and uh, you know, we hadn't even been home a week, and we were, you know, filming songs live for this big movie release, and um, Ricky was, you know, announcing us and, Hey, these guys just got back from Europe. And it just was like, at that time, I don't think that 
uh, kid in my position could ask for a more bitch in life than what was going on at that time. It was, <laughs> yeah. it, it was everything and more, man. <laughs> you name it, you know. Now, how about that? Uh, the decline of Western civilization. I mean, that movie. Um, if somehow, some way, somebody actually out there listening has not seen this movie. I don't know where the hell you've been, but it, it was truly the definition of that era, that movie. Yeah, it was. It it really was. Um, it's funny because, um, and I and I hope she won't get mad at me. I don't think she would for saying this, but Penelope Spheris directed the movie, and um, Penelope has a daughter Anna, who's a real. She's a great girl. I actually just spoke to her today because I was watching a repeat of uh, RuPaul's Drag Race last night, and they actually had an episode where Anna and her husband, who's the keyboard player for the cult, Damon Fox now, um, they had they were on an episode where they dressed the husbands up like like w- like women, and they got remarried, and then I was like, holy shit, that's my fucking friend Anna, and I just talked to her today, actually, but uh, um, there was a time where we were kind of dating and stuff, and, you know, I was over at her house, and... Um, playing her some i was like hey you know this is re- early recordings of the first record and this is how it's going and you know penelope was like her mom came down was listening and was like whoa this is really cool you know and originally she had put us in a she had put bathroom wall and some other movie um in this movie she was doing at the time called dudes um and uh and it was on the soundtrack and whatnot and so that i think that's kind of one of the first ways that penelope was exposed to faster but she just dug the band and, you know, the next thing we know, we were out on tour and, you know, our manager was like, Hey, you know, she's going to do a second decline and, you know, she wants you guys to be in it. And so we were like, yeah, you know, let's do it. That's, that would be awesome. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely like for it. I mean, like you said, anybody who hasn't seen it, you know, has been living under a rock for 30 years, but, um, if you want to, you know, if you want the, the best and the worst, what was going on back then just watch that movie um it's to me it's got three interesting angles it's got you know conversations with guys that have already made it like ozzy and steven tyler and joe perry and kiss and then it's got the conversations with the guys that are on their way up and are in the process of making it like foster pussycat megadeth on and on poison and then it's got a lot of interviews with people that are um that are that in their own words, oh, we're going to make it, you know, we're going to be fucking right. rock stars. Well, what about a backup plan? I don't need a backup plan now. We're going to be fucking <laughs> rock stars. <laughs> we should bag and groceries at Ralph. But, you know, it's, so it's, yeah, man, it's got like different points of view and, and it's got some shocking scenes that Chris Holmes scene, who could forget that pool scene, man, fuck. Right. And so, yeah, man, it was, I mean, it definitely showed you the good and the bad of, uh, of that time, <laughs> that you know, period for sure. Yeah, that, and, that, and it was a cool movie, you know. It totally was, and it's still. I mean, to this day, people still like. <laughs> you, you watch it, yeah. You just, it totally brings you back to those times, and and I just, it kind of bums me out too because we're not in those times anymore. <laughs> it is kind of a bummer, you know. It's true because that was. Like the last so, uh, great. Yeah, scene also, in too, LA. you were saying about. Um, what's her name? Guns N' Roses in. Uh, touring with them in 87. Yeah. Yeah, we went to Europe with them. Um, like, like, both our records came out on the first day, and we both had done some U.S. touring. They were out with the Colt. We were out with Ace and YT. And then. And uh, I think our tour ended in New York, and then we flew straight from New York to Hamburg, Germany, man, and met up with them the next day. And it was like, you know, at the time, I mean, none of us knew what was, what our careers, what our paths were going to take us down. And, you know, not, those guys didn't know. We didn't know. It's it's weird, man, because when we went to Europe to open for GNR, at the time, our album was actually higher in the Billboard charts than theirs. And it was like, you know, I mean, we were just, two bands from LA that knew each other and had played a lot of local shows. And, and then we, you know, here we are bumping into each other in Hamburg, Germany, going on a tour together. And obviously, you know, it goes without saying that, you know, anybody that knows the history of Guns N' Roses and Faster Pussycat knows that that was like, those were the early days. And so 
that was when um, the bands were at their wildest and craziest. And so, I mean, everything and anything happened on those tours, you know. I mean, I remember walking back to the hotel and looking up at the six-story balcony, and there's Mark Michaels drunk out, of, drunk off his gourd, throwing all the furniture in the hotel room six stories down into the subway station below. And you know, the next thing, our manager is like, well, the police are here, and we have a choice, you know, either Mark stays somewhere else tonight or we're all going to jail. And, you know, it's like, and he goes and stays with GNR, and then they get into their own scuffle with Mark. And, you know, it's like that was just a daily occurrence back then. It was, you know, rock and roll in Europe on the road at the time and with two young upcoming bands. And it was a blast, and it was a great tour. You know, I think it was a great package, and there's still tons of fans to this day that go, hey, man, you know, we saw that show, and it was, Still to this day, one of the classic rock and roll shows, and so it was. You know, it was really cool to be a part of that too, for sure. Now I saw you guys in '87, um, opening for Alice Cooper. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was another cool tour. You know, one of the reasons that obviously I think we we sold a lot of records initially and did well was you know we had a good manager Warren Etner who had been a rock star in his own right um, with the grassroots and he just managed to get us on a lot of really good tours Um, and one of the you know early tours I think we we went out with Ace and Y&T and then it was like Motorhead and Alice Cooper and to be you know to be 23 and on your first major tour and to be out with a guy like Alice Cooper who's not only humble but approachable you know doesn't party is you know is all there mentally is just a nice guy and willing to you know take a moment out of his time and talk to you anytime you want was was truly you know a, a really bitching thing as a young kid you know um so it's uh it was that was a really really cool tour and it was a really cool tour to watch from you know behind backstage and watch how everything was set up and how the production was done. Um, I will get into one quick story. Alice had um, chartered a 727 plane to fly um, his band and, and Faster Pussycat back from Alaska to L.A., and the plane got diverted because of bad weather, really bad weather. The plane had to go around this huge storm front, and we were diverted all the way to, like, Idaho or Montana to land on some small strip in some little isolated airport, and... It was an old chartered 727, and as the plane came out of this cloud bank, there was a mountain, like, right friggin' in front of us, and the plane almost hit the mountain. We almost obviously all crashed and died, and it was it was a really gnarly, intense moment, and then uh, the pilot pulled up and avoided the crash, and um, we uh, had heard that, like, Cameron Crowe had heard that story. I don't know if it's true or not, but I, we had heard that Cameron Crowe had heard that story, and that was kind of part of the um, I don't even know the word I'm looking for but part of the um, the idea for that scene and yeah inspiration thanks hello 52 brain <laughs> fart um, that was part of the inspiration for that um, near plane crash scene and almost famous we were, we were told was that he had heard that story and um, like probably 20 years later I got a letter from a guy and he's like you know I worked for Alice Cooper and I was on that plane and here's a picture that I've had on my desk for 20 years. And he sent it to me a copy of it, at least I think. And it was a picture of me and him and Alice on this little airstrip in Montana with a, with the plane in the background buried, like almost up to its windows in snow. So, <laughs> Holy cow. You no, know, it's just, yeah, it's, it's shit like that, that, you know, like, yeah, I almost died with Alice Cooper on a chartered flight, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> Now, now, when you, when yeah. you tour like with an Alice Cooper, or uh, you guys also got to tour with Kiss back then, like when you guys when you're touring with people like that, and now I, I don't know if if Kiss was the same way as Alice, but it sounds like almost like they're taking you under their wings and giving you like rock, uh, like class. You know what I mean? Like teaching you the ins and outs of the business. That's true. I mean, that's a that's a excellent way to look at it in a way is that yeah because you know every big band whether it's Kiss or any big band Alice Cooper you know when they're 
you know, when their manager comes in and says, you know, here's, here's a list of bands that propose that we can propose for opening acts, you know, they do have a large part in deciding who's going to open for them and whether it's a business decision or partly personal decision. Like when we got the Motley Crue, Dr. Feelgood tour, it was, you know, largely because I had lived with Nikki six and at the time we were really, really close and had spoken on the phone about going on tour together and whatnot. So whether it's, you know, whatever the decision may be to take you out that, you know, the okay comes from the band ultimately. And it is kind of like them going, yeah, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're okay with us. You know, we're good with taking them out because it affects their business. They're taking you out because you're doing well and you're helping them fill the seats and, and, and whatnot. And so, um, yeah, that's, you know, that's a huge nod of approval from whatever band takes you out. And so, you know, you, you go out and you, you know, you, you, uh, you just kind of try to watch what's going I mean, for me, I was told a long time ago by somebody very knowledgeable in the business that sold millions of records. They said, uh, well, you know, they said for the first 10 years that you're in the business, keep your mouth shut and your eyes and ears open and you'll do great. And I knew exactly what he meant. You know, when you're in the, when you're in the early stages of your career, you don't know shit, but keep your eyes and ears open and learn. And that's what I did, you know? And, uh, that is what it's like, you know, when you're out with Kiss and you're in the same hotel with them and, 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 you know, and you see them in the bar and you're talking to them and, you know, and it's like, fuck, man, you know, I was 13 years old watching these guys on TV and they were like my life. They were everything to me. And it's like, you know, now you're, I mean, you're not an equal as far as record sales goes, but you're, you're on tour with them and it's, it's the most bitching fucking thing in the world. And it's a huge nod to your career that, you know, all these bands have taken, I mean, Faster Pussycat was really, really fortunate that we had so many great tours, whether it was Alice Cooper, David Lee Roth, two tours with Kiss, Motley Crue, on and on and on. You know, we, we were out with Ozzy on the No More Tours tour. You know, we were out with a lot of great, great acts. And so that is a definite confirmation at the time of, your, you know, where your career's headed. So, yeah, for sure. Now, now you had mentioned uh, back at the time when you lived with Nikki Six. Now you lived with Nikki like in like the peak of the party days with Nikki, didn't you? Um, well, I've known Nikki. Well, I I I go back with Nikki a long time. I've known him since the like late seventies when he was in London, and him and Lizzie Gray were at the Starwood every night, and so was I. I used to call them the Peacock Twins because they were, you know, on their platforms dressed in all black with their hair three feet high, towered over everybody. So I'd be, I, before I knew them, I'd be like, oh, there's the Peacock Twins, you know. And uh, so I've, you know, I had known him through all those crazy years and all the heavy partying years. But actually when I moved in with him was because we had both just gone through the same rehab um, at the same time. And so, you know, they say when you get out, you know, go live with somebody else who's sober and support each other. And so rather than moving back to where I was living, Nikki was like, you know, why don't you come live with me? It'll, you know, help the both of us. We'll support each other. And so when I lived with him was just after all that madness. Um, but I mean, to, to, you know, it was definitely had its own madness to be sure. Cause even in sobriety, there was still an energy and a craziness and that funness about us that was that it was a great time in my life, and I'll always be super appreciative to him for you know giving me a room in his house and letting me stay there and um, and just being like a big brother to me. So, but um, it was we weren't living together during the partying, but we had already done a lot of partying together before that. <laughs> so right, right. Um, yeah, we were together for both kind, both times, the, the parting times, and and even the times where where drugs weren't being done anymore, it was still parting times in a lot of other ways, you know. So, um, in in a lot of ways, we beca- we both became a lot more fucking crazy as sober guys. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with, with all with all the like things like that, I mean like. <laughs> <laughs> the peacock to the peacock twins and you know it's all these th- things you've been through in um 
not only your career, but like leading into your career and over the years, do you ever like sit and think about writing a book? Yeah, you know, it's funny that you brought that up because I've been asked many, many times, you know, why don't you write a book? Why don't you write a book? And I've even had publishing companies say, have you ever thought about writing a book? We would, you know, we would, we would back it. And there was actually a time where I was starting to do it um, with a roommate of mine who was a film major and we were starting to like um, go over, like I was vocally talking and he was transcribing things and with the hopes of doing a book. But um, lately I've been giving it more thought again because I, for some reason, God's been really good to me. And even before I was a quote unquote rock star on my own, I had so many like experiences that I think prepared me for it. And just, you know, just, I mean, I was lucky kid. I, you know, I had a really great childhood and I grew up in Encino, California and Studio City, California, where a lot of movie stars and TV stars lived. And my neighbors were like Aretha Franklin and Walt Disney and um, John Wayne. And, you know, and I was friends with all these people's kids and you know i knew bob newhart's kid and i went to the beverly hills country club with bob newhart jr and bob newhart and and we had lunch with dean martin at the beverly hills country club so you know it's funny i was talking to my wife the other night and i'm like you know what would be a great title for my book and originally i wanted to call it what i did after my bar mitzvah but (laughs) i think i'm gonna call it fame was all around me if i ever do it uh, so, so like when you were growing up with all like these these people uh, as, as neighbors and all like did you go and like cut their lawn or anything like that <laughs> actually i don't know if i cut their lawn but i did some more bitching stuff than that like um like bobby sherman everybody remembers the pinup guy bobby sherman he was one of my neighbors right. and like on the on the 5th of july i would go through all my neighbors trash can they would all have these huge fireworks shows on the 4th of July um, because they all had money and they would invite hundreds of people over. And this was back in the seventies where you were allowed to have these huge friggin' fireworks shows. And on the 5th of July, I would go through everybody's trash cans and pull out all the unused fireworks and stuff. (laughs) And uh, you know, things like that. Um, I don't know if I ever cut their lawn, but you know, I was, yeah, I mean, I was friends. I mean, I was schoolmates with Billy Davis jr. Whose parents were Billy Davis and Marilyn Mancou from the fifth dimension. And, so, you know, from a young age, which is why I said, you know, I, my new title, if, if I do the book, is probably going to, I was thinking of, was fame was all around me because ever, ever since a little kid, that was just my life, you know, that was just, I mean, you know, I used to have to pass Michael Jackson's house on the way to my house down the street and, you know, there'd be, you know, 40 girls all day parked outside of the Jackson residence and, I mean, that was just all in a, a regular occurrence for me growing up and so... I, in a way, I always felt like that was like God giving me these little lessons. You know, one day you're going to be, you know, you're going to have this. And so just exposing me to all that shit as a, as a, as a kid, I don't know. It sounds wacky, but it's what I kind of feel. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, how about, like, did you ever have, like, like who was the weirdest person maybe, like, you ever, like, jammed with or played uh, on stage with? Oh, my God. (laughs) You just mentioned half the book. Um, (laughs) Damn, the weirdest. Um, There was some definite characters. I remember, (laughs) I hope this doesn't sound wrong, but I'll never forget touring with Ozzy because, like, and I respect the shit out of Ozzy, as does everybody. I mean, he's, you know, he's a fucking metal giant. But it was funny when I toured with them because, you know, when you tour with a band, you also have a different perspective of, of them, just like touring with Kiss. No longer are they these guys that were on your TV screen and makeup. You know, now you're on tour with Kiss, and they're these guys you see every day, and you see them in the morning when they get off the tour bus in their bathrobes, unmade up. And, you know, and I remember, like, I remember, like, one of the first shows that we did with Ozzy, like, um... I was sitting in my dressing room right after we played and Ozzy was, here comes Ozzy waddling down the hallway to go on stage. And as he crossed the doorway, I was like, he had these like baggy silk drawers on and it looked like he had like shit in his pants. He had, they were just hanging really low and he kind of like wobbled past the dressing room door. And I remember going, that looks like some old man who just shit in his pants. And it's like, that's not meant to be an insult at all. It's just like, it's just like, you know, it's like everybody thinks of like fucking Ozzy, uh, you know, the iron metal 
master and it's like you see this you know this old man walk you know bent over like slowly walking past your dresser and door on the way to stage and it's just you're like, holy shit, you know? And, uh, I mean, <laughs> believe me, all respect to Ozzy, but, you know, he was definitely a character, you know? And uh, so, but, I mean, obviously, I fucking respect the hell out of him. I saw, I mean, I saw the original Ozzy Osbourne band with Randy and Rudy and Tommy Aldridge, and to this day, uh, one of the freaking best shows I've ever seen. I mean, they were just larger than life. So, but, uh, yeah, so, but there's been a lot of, people I've been in bands with well-known and, and unwell-known. I mean, I was in a band with Michael Nesmith from the Monkees, other son, not Jason Nesmith, but Christian Nesmith, the other son that people okay. don't know as well, who, you know, he was a talented, talented, brilliant guitar player, but, you know, one of those creative geniuses that's also like a total madman, you know? So, um, yeah, there's been a lot of them. <laughs> it's hard to point out one, believe me, you know? <laughs> How, how about um you had mentioned to me about uh, Chaka Khan? Yeah, that's, that's pretty funny. Brent brought that up the other night. I had kind of forgotten about it. I was in a band. Um, this was like shit eighty nine. It was like the it was called the Liberators. It was me and Brent and Phil Lewis and some, some other guys. And we were I don't even remember the name of the club. I think it was called at my father's place in Santa Monica, California. And right before we went on, I went out in the alley to have a cigarette, and I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, this big, huge black guy walks up to me in this alley, and I'm standing there by myself, and this dude's huge, and he's like, hey, you know, and I'm like, holy shit, am I about to get mugged? And he goes, <laughs> you wouldn't be in the band, would you? And I'm like, uh, yeah, actually, I am. And he's like, hey, come with me. And I'm like, I'm thinking, holy fuck, this guy's going to fucking, you know, do me in the alley and take my wallet. But he's like, come with me. I, I want to introduce you to somebody. And I'm like well, this is scary, but intriguing. All right. So, you know, he walks over this limo and he opens the door of the limo and there's Shaka Khan sitting there and she proceeds to tell me how she's on tour with Prince and the show that night got canceled and she feels like jamming with somebody. And would it be cool if she comes up and jams with our band? And I'm like, uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be okay, but let me, let me go ask, you know? So I walk in and I, and I walk up to Brent and Phil and, and it's funny cause they both looked at me like, yeah, fucking right, dude. Like, what are you smoking back there? But I'm like, Hey man, you know, Shaka Khan is in, in a limo outside out back and she wants to get up and jam with us. And I mean, literally Phil just looked at me like that. That's funny. Now let's go play. And I'm like, no, seriously, man, she's fucking outside and she wants to play with us. So I, I'm like, look, and they looked outside and saw her, and, I, and they're like, yeah, man, tell her to come in. So we're like, she's like, I go, what do you want to do? And she's also an awesome drummer. She's like, well, I want to play a little drums. I want to sing a little funk, some blues. I'm like, cool, let's do it. So uh, at the end of the show, we brought her up on stage, and first she, she started on the drums, and I went into some, like, funky slap and bass thing, and we just kind of improvised, and then... And then uh, she got up and sang, and we just did blues and A, and she, and she, you know, I mean, obviously anybody that knows Shaka Khan knows she's like one of the preeminent female R&B voices ever. So sure. it was it was really awesome. And um, on my refrigerator, I actually have a picture of me and her on stage that night jamming. And uh, it's a it's a you know it's it's funny because you'd think you'd remember that throughout your life, but with so many friggin' incidents like that. It was like Brent the other night's like, yeah, you remember with Shaka Khan? I'm like, fuck, you know, I actually forgot about that, but now that you bring it up, and it's like, yeah, that was that was a very another you know another great honor, man, jam with Shaka Khan, you know, she's a legend, so yeah, yeah, it was pretty bitching <laughs> to say the least. I, see, I would be freaked out, like, what the hell am I gonna play with Shaka Khan? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, you know, that, I think that's also one of those times where it kind of reinforces, thank God I've practiced a lot and, and put, put some time into my craft so that you can, you know, when she goes, I want to start with some funk and, and, and drawn drums. And, and I had, you know, gone to Berkeley College of Music for a while as a kid and done a lot of studying and, and was a music major f for a while and had really put a lot of time in and, and was a pretty decent funk player. And, you know, knew my blues progressions and whatnot. So it's like, you know, thank God I've, at that, it's like a time like that where you're like, thank God I've done my homework. So you don't look like a fucking fool when she goes, well, let's, let's do blues and A and you, you know what you're doing, you know, it's like, you don't stand there <laughs> like a fool, but you actually pull it off, which is nice. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. and, and, and 
speaking of like fame all around you, didn't you were also were telling me at one time you like ran into um uh well, what the hell's his name? Uh Christopher Lloyd. In a bar. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's it's so fucking weird cuz the list just keeps going on and on when I start to think about it, but yeah, man, I mean, I was in Japan with Faster Pussycat. Um, I think it was our first big tour of Japan, and we were headlining like three nights at NHK Hall in Tokyo, which is the big hall there, and we were pretty big at the time. But um, it was a night off, and we there's a club in Tokyo. I don't know if it's even still around, but it was it's called the Lexington Queen, and it was for many, many years, it was like the rock and roll bar that everybody hung out at. You know, you'd walk in and there'd be pictures of the Stones there and Aerosmith and on and on on their walls and everybody hangs out there and all the American models working in Tokyo hang out there and so one night I, I, I couldn't find anybody to go with me so I was just like, fuck it. It was in walking distance of our hotel and I went there and I walk in and it was a quiet night. There's like a bunch of different bars so I, I went up to this one upper bar where there wasn't, there just wasn't that many people. And I go over to the bar to order a drink, and I look over to my left, and there's Christopher Lloyd sitting there by himself having a drink. And you know, I mean, I had grown up watching Taxi. I knew who Ignatowski was and Back to the right. Future. And I look over there, and he's sitting there by himself, and I'm like, "Holy shit, man, Christopher Lloyd, what's going on?" And he was really fucking cool, and he's like, "Hey, man, what's going on? What's your name?" And you know, and we start to chat. And, I start to tell him, you know, yeah, you know, I'm here with this rock and roll band, Faster Pussycat. We're playing NHK Hall the next three nights. You should come down, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, he's buying me drinks. And and, and I'm like, what are you doing here? And he's like, you know, I'm uh, here promoting Back to the Future 3. And and, and it was funny because at one point, like, a couple of the techs that were working for Faster came up and saw me sitting at the bar. And they're all like, oh, man, holy shit. We're going to go run back to the hotel and get our cameras and you know, when I think I have a picture of like me and him and like all these guys that work for the band and everybody's like crowding into this picture and whatnot. But, you know, they all respectfully got their picture and then left us alone. And, you know, at one point we're like, well, let's go to another bar. And we ended up like just me and Christopher Lloyd ended up spending the night like bar hopping in Tokyo and just drinking together and having a really good time. And it was like 430 in the morning with some hot American blonde model walks up to him and whispers in his ear and he's like, well, listen, Eric, it's been nice hanging with you. I'm going to try and make it down to the show tomorrow night and I'll see you later. And I'm like, yeah, I don't blame you. Have fun, you know? And, and, uh, that was, you know, just another one of those freaking weird nights in my life, man. It just seemed to happen over and over. (laughs) You know, it's funny. Like there's some people who like, are are like you like where fame is around them like no matter where they go or wherever they like always run into other celebrities and you're like one of them people like even before uh you know faster you've had experiences and then during the years of faster and i'm sure you're probably out there in vegas still having wild experiences like that <laughs> yeah i am you know it's, i mean now the scene's here in vegas so it's just a continuation of my life you know and uh yeah, I don't know. It's weird. I, I it's it's funny, I, I never really question why it happens. I just kinda wake up every day and roll with the punches, but it it always seems to happen to me. Weird shit like that happens all the friggin' time and it's just kind of my life for some reason, man. <laughs> I can't really explain it, but it's just always it, it just always seems I always seem to be there when 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 that person's there and and uh you know and shit happens and it's all fun and it's all good and i always say man you know if and and it's funny that you brought up the book because i actually to be honest with you i actually decided like within the last few days that i'm gonna start working on it and i yeah, actually you got to, man. start yeah i got to uh, you know and and i want to do it before you know, not that I'm getting seen now, but before a lot of those memories fade, I want to, I want to try to, you know, remember everything. And it's like, I really have more than one book in me. I have my life even before Faster Pussycat, like you said, but, um, you know, definitely starting with the rock and roll life. And, um, so I start, I actually pulled out a notebook and, you know, started writing this week and, and, uh, have been in touch with a publishing company who wants to see like, you know, they, they're like, you know, give us the first 20 pages, make it grab people by the balls, you know, and, and send it to us. And 
we'll see what happens, man. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm positively keeping my fingers crossed that, uh, that, it, that, uh, that it'll happen and I'll finally get it done. Cause I, I see no reason why it, it won't be as um, entertaining to the reader as, you know, anything else put out by anybody else for sure. Yeah. You know? absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had such weird shit. I mean, I was playing with Ricky Bird, the, a great rock and roll guitar player who's now in the Hall of Fame, who was in Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. Um, originally, you know, he was like in the I, I Love Rock and Roll video, and he went on to play with uh, Ian Hunter when Mick Ronson got sick, and he was uh, in Roger Daltrey's solo band and ended up with one of Pete Townsend numbered Who guitars that Roger gave him, and I think he had number eight or one of them, the broken, one of the broken Les Pauls, but uh, anyway, so, um, so um, Ricky's wife was this famous rock and roll publicist named Carol Kay, who was managing us, and she did publicity for the Stones and Kiss, and, and was working with Ace Frehley and Peter Frampton, and um, who I actually talked to her not too long ago, but you know, I had known Ace from touring with him for like all that time, and, and, and I always gotten on well with him, and we'd gone out to the limelight in Chicago partying together and just always hit it off back in those days. And so I was in the office one day doing publicity with Ricky and Ace comes walking in and he's, and I'm like, Hey, what's going on? And he's like, man, I'm putting a band together, going out and doing the house of blues and you want to play bass with my band. And I was like, fuck yeah, I do. And he's, Dude, you were in kids, you know? So, sure. <laughs> and then Carol hears it. Carol hears him asking me, and she's like, no, Ace, you're not stealing my husband's bass player. No, and Ace is like, hey, it's a doggy dog world. Eric can do what he wants, and she's like, no, Ace, you know, and she, like, totally nicks it. She's like, I'm not, I won't do publicity for you anymore if you steal my husband's bass player, and so, the, so it kind of got, like, like, I don't want to use the word cock block. That's the wrong word, but anyway, you know what I mean, but, you know, it's just like, another story for the book you know that's just like the Lenny Kravitz story last time we talked it's just like that kind of shit is my life for some reason I don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's freaking crazy yeah and if it had been the days of the cell phone I would have I would have just handed in my number and gone you know hey let's you know let's talk later call me you know and right. it's kind of funny um I mean I don't know how much time we have left but Faster Pussycat was the only band that ever fucked with Kiss on stage in the history of Kiss. You know, they had the song called Take It Off, and uh, right. they would bring out these strippers, you know, and they would bring out strippers in every city they were in. So the last night of the tour, we told the strippers, you guys aren't going on tonight. We're going on in your place. And they're like, okay. So we all, you know, we got our hair in pigtails and threw on the strippers' outfits and high heels, but we didn't tell anybody we were going to do it, you know. And, uh, we, you know, we threw on our robes and we were quietly like snuck down the hall and, you know, I go running up the ramp at the beginning and take it off and Gene's bodyguard grabs me and he's like, no, no one goes on stage. No one fucks with Kiss. No one's ever fucked with Kiss. No one will fuck with Kiss. And as he's saying that, I'm like, go, go, go. And Tammy and Greg go running around me and Brent. So, and I run out of my robe and we're on stage and, and it's really funny because, you know, Gene's got his back to us singing and. And he sees the audience pointing and laughing and he turns around and he's just like, Oh, they got us. And he, you know, he's like, ladies and gentlemen, faster pussycat and laughing and stuff. But like, uh, Paul's, I see Paul over at the other side of the stage and he's like yelling something in the ear of another security guy. And like, you know, the joke goes off and it's funny. And we go running back in our dressing room and Bruce Kulik's girlfriend walks up and goes, well, you want to know how the joke went? And we're like, yeah, sure. Why not? And she's like, well, Gene loved it. He thought it was funny. She's like, but I, if I were you guys, I'd leave before the show's over. And we're like, why? And she's like, well, Paul told his security guard, I don't care if you have to break their legs, no one comes on stage with Kiss. And, and he's serious. So if you guys, you might want to split before they're off stage. And we did, you know. So Holy years shit. later when I, yeah, so years later when Kiss got back together with the makeup, I went down to the forum and I, you know, went and found Ace's tech. And I'm like, you know, have Ace call me. I'd like to come to the show tonight. And he did. He was really nice and gave me um, eighth row center tickets and backstage passes. And, and at the time, Tommy was just their production manager. He wasn't playing with them. And, uh, and uh, after the show, my friend that I brought with me was like, let's go backstage. Let's go backstage. And I'm like, well, let's, let's think about this. And he's like, Fuck that. This <laughs> we have passes. And I'm like, you don't understand, dude. I'm like, the last time I saw Paul, he wanted to break my legs. And he's like, Oh, come on, man, we got to go. And so, I'm like, all right, well, well, we'll just, you know, we'll quickly go. We'll say hello and get the fuck out of there, which is basically <laughs> what we did, you know. And 
uh, said our respects, but you know, Paul didn't say anything to me. I, I, you know, I don't know if he was still pissed off or that I, I'm sure he remembered the night. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Another, man. Yeah. Another funny story for the book, I guess. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I shouldn't give them all of them up, but I guess there won't be anything to read, you know. <laughs> but yeah, in the history of Kiss, Faster Pussycat's the only band to ever uh, go on stage with Kiss during their show. So that was fun. That was a good night. So, so through the years, I mean, how many other like established artists have come to you to try to get you to play with them? Like, I mean, you, you said eight, you had the opportunity to play with Ace and you, you got quote unquote cock blocked, but has there been <laughs> other bands that we'd be like, holy shit. I think, I mean, I wish there was more that I could say with all these great stories, but I mean, you know, like I said last time, you know, I got the call from, uh, Lenny Kravitz management about auditioning, turn it down. I got the offer from Ace and it got, you know, in, interrupted, so to speak. Um, I think those were the only pretty much like two. There's been bands like way, 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 way back in the early days of Rat um, when they were like, I think they're still living in Culver City, a local band, you know, trying out bass players. I went down and tried out. And um, and I'm, I won't get into specifics, but for reasons that I won't get into, I, you know, played with them for like a couple weeks and then, and then, and then, uh, decided not to do it because of some things that were going on. But, uh, um, you know, just I, there's, um, I mean, I've been lucky. Enough, I mean, I've been fortunate enough to jam with like tons of people, but I think those were the mo- the main like timing ones where if timing was a little better, um, it would have been cool, you know, but yeah, I mean, uh, I've, I've, me and Greg and Brent and Tammy sat in a club and in, in a tiny, tiny club one night and watched Prince play drums, piano, and guitar for about an hour from like five feet away, and that 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 was really cool. But um, I've you know sat in a house up in the Hollywood Hills with David Bowie for an hour one on one talking to him and stuff. So, but I mean, as far as people that actually asked me, I think it was like you know the the Ace thing, and then getting invited to audition for Kravitz and. I'm sure there's some things that aren't coming up to my, in my mind right now as far as, like, fine. well, yeah, I mean, you know, like, when Buck Cherry was first made it huge and JB left the band, the bass player, I got the call the next day from Todd and Josh calling me on a three-way call saying, you know, we'll be back in town. Do you want to come down and try out and giving me the list of songs to learn? And I was like, yeah, and uh, learned them. And then they decided to break up, and that's when they broke up for – like eight or nine years before they had their second career. So I guess that would be another one to the list. I, I'm, I'm sure I would have gotten that gig. So, but, uh, be cool. you know, it's lo- largely, you know, right time, right place in this biz. So Absolutely. Well, you're, yeah. you're also like, like right now you're, I mean, you're still, uh, you're playing with jet boy. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they, uh, I've been, I've known, I mean, again, another band I've known since the early, you know, well, mid eighties, since the early days of that LA glam rock revival scene, they were like, you know, along with faster and, and LA guns and guns N' roses were like, I think we were like the four kind of movers and shakers back then. And they were, uh, they were from San Francisco, but they were always in LA and we would play shows together. So I've known them forever and always remained friends with them, especially Billy Rowe and, so, uh, yeah, I had, I had been talking to Billy for the last couple of years about, you know, one of these days, you know, we should, you know, hook up and it would be mutually beneficial and whatnot. And we'd always talk about it. And then at the beginning of the year, Billy, you know, reached out to me and said, hey, man, you know, um, we need a bass player and here's some shows we got coming up. And if the first show goes well, we just want to keep in the band. And I said, let's do it. And, the first show was uh, in Denver at the Buffalo Rose, and it went really great, and everybody dug it, and all the guys in the band really enjoyed it, and I had a great time. And so, yeah, so um, so now I, I do the live shows with Jeff Boy whenever they play. Um, they don't play as much that as much anymore as they used to. Um, right. You know, Mickey lives in Hawaii now. Um, he just had a son, so you know, last oh. year he was home getting ready to have his first child and um but we're gonna be i'm glad you actually brought that up we're gonna be 
Um, Ricky Rackman just asked Billy if uh, Jet Boy would play at the Cat House 30th anniversary at the Roxy. And then I'm mm-hmm. uh, not sure what day that's going to fall on. But, um, and then we're also going to be at the Rock and Skull Festival in Pekin, Illinois, October 28th with uh, LA Guns. So that, that'll be fun. Um, so, yeah. So another band I, you know, always thought was really I thought I always, you know, bef- even before I played with them, I always had a big respect for them. I thought they were a really cool band yeah. that mixed, you know, punk and hard rock in a great way, had a cool look. And so it was like a real, real cool thing to get a phone call to join Jet Boy. So, yeah, so I'm doing that. And, you know, and, and ever since this shit went down, I've, I mean, I don't want to bring up names till it's more firmed out and confirmed, but I've been talking to somebody who's a, really great guitar player, really great singer. And, uh, hopefully him and I, uh, hopefully that'll be the seed of something really cool to start something very cool. And so we're going to get together and start writing and, and, um, see where that goes. So, I mean, I'll die playing rock and roll. I'll never stop. So, um, yeah. And, you know, and I always also have my, you know, eyes and ears open. Like, like my friend told me a long time ago. So, you know, if, if if the right um, situation came to me and was like a touring or recording situation, um, and the situation was right, you know, I, I'm I'm always keeping my mind open and eyes and ears open. So right on. Now how yeah. about like actually as I'm I'm scanning through and I'm going through things as we're talking, like I'm seeing and it's been in the news for the last couple of weeks. Um, Rex Brown from uh, from Pantera is going to be doing a solo album and it just came out now I'm looking at it where, um, or I'm just seeing it now, the album's going to be like a 70s style rock, uh, album. Did you ever think about like maybe like just doing your own thing and putting your own like album out? You know, I would love to do that. It, that's, that's kind of a two answer question. A, I, I would love to do that. Any, any, um, any artist who who also is a songwriter and has collected a lot of material, uh, I think would think about doing that. So I would love to do that. Uh, quite, uh, answer A would be, I would love to do that. Answer B would be, I sort of kind of did that in a way with super cool. That other band, I, one of the bands I had with Stacy blades and Vic Fox. Cause that was like probably 95% material I wrote. And so, and it was a band that I put together and, 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 you know, I was the one that booked the tours in Japan and got the production, the, the, uh, the, 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 um, distribution deal in Japan and whatnot. So, um, that kind of was sort of a a solo project in a way, but it, but it it was a band and it was called super cool. So it was a band, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, even though I feel like I kind of did that was super cool. I mean, I, I'm still always writing. I mean, every day I pick up my guitar and I, and I, and I record song ideas and, and I have a lot of stuff that I've been knocking around for, you know, 10, 15 years. And so, yeah, I mean, if somebody came to me and the situation was right, I, I've got some, I, what I think is some really killer material. And I, I, I would love, I mean, it's like every musician's, dream to be able to you know have somebody say hey you know do you want to put out a record of your stuff and and you know pick different players for different songs that's like yeah man i would i would right. freaking love to do that yeah congratulations to rex brown man cool for him fuck yeah <laughs> see now you should do something like uh, take a page out of Nikki six's book and uh like when he did uh his first book the heroin diaries and he did the 6 a.m album with it see you, you do something like that that's that's kind of that's a good idea man you know i mean you know put out a book and in conjunction with the book do do a musical project that mutually support each other was i thought that was a brilliant idea that he had and you know i mean nikki six is a master of great ideas and so yeah i would i would love to do something like that um you know you know when the when i finally uh finish this lord knows when that's going to be i just started it but i mean (laughs) you know hopefully one day it will come to fruition and come out and um if it does that would be a brilliant way to promote it by you know putting something musical together and going out and promoting the book i think that would be a great way to do things absolutely yeah hell yeah 
Now, yeah, absolutely. a couple other things to, just to, to go through before we let you go. Um, what's what's the day in, in in Eric Stacy's life like? Like like what do you do like all day long? <laughs> what do you fucking do? Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's no. I mean, I, I, it's not a cop out to say there's no set schedule in my life. You know, I mean, I. I'm definitely a, a, a night owl. I, I, I mean, I, I, I routinely stay up late. You know, I'll watch like a movie with playing guitar. You know, getting song ideas while watching a movie. Normally, stay up till friggin' five in the morning. Go to bed at five thirty. You know, wake up around noon, one o'clock, and then, uh, you know, I, I have a personal trainer that comes over to the house twice a week that uh, I work out with, and we do like a combination of yoga and martial arts and things like that. Um, that that's important to me now at my age, and uh, you know I I I do a lot of um, just you know during the days I, I I mean I do a lot of contacting people uh, try you know about the career you you have to be active sure. and uh, you know talking to people on the phone and and emails and and stuff like that and, and I try to I have like uh, you know I have my studio here at the house with basses and guitars and that's like a big focus of my life um so you know i mean there's it seems like there's always something going on one way or the other um you know saturday night i'll be seeing degeneration they're they're in, they're in town playing the beauty bar and i'm looking forward to that oh, another nice. band that i freaking love have you heard their new record by any chance i've heard a couple tunes off it i'm so pissed because they actually they played here in philly like three weeks ago but it was on a thursday night and we were live on the air Oh man, yeah, I remember that. That was like two nights before their uh, record release at Irving Plaza uh, with right. the Fighters and uh, some other friends right. of mine. Those are good friends of mine too. You know, another fucking great young up- upcoming band, the Biters, Man, everybody should check them out. Um, but you know, that's. I mean, my, you know, my life. I mean, a typical day could be anything. But I mean, like I said, I you know have my studio. I I, ha- I try to stay in shape and exercise, and then at nights I go out and. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm going to see DJ. Uh, I'll go see a band. Uh, go jam with friends bands. Um, definitely try to stay busy, stay active. Um, you know, I, I wish. I mean, I, I do miss the road. I, I right now, that's the one thing that's missing in my life is that steady gig out on the road where you're, you know, making some decent dough and and traveling around and meeting people and getting out there live. I wish right. there was a little bit more of that going on. And, you know, who knows? Maybe somebody will hear this who has that perfect situation and whatever. I mean, but, uh, but you know, I'm definitely not hurting for things to do. <laughs> so. <laughs> now, w- when we ended last time, um, I was going to ask a question. I said, you know what? I'm going to save this for next time we talk. And the question was, uh, were you a cop or something at one time? I knew where you were going with that. Um, you know, I, I'll put it this way. Like, I've been in the rock and roll business, fuck, probably almost 40 years. But uh, there was one time in my life where I just got friggin' sick and fucking tired of the music business and all the bullshit going on. And that was around 2009. And I was just like, you know what? This is what I've been doing for so long. I need to get out. I, need, I just need to fucking get out. And then the question becomes, what are you going to do, you know? when you've been right. a bass player in a rock and roll band for 30 plus years. And I, you know, ever since I was a little kid, man, my grandfather used to take me skeet shooting and I always had, you know, a, a, ho- a hobby of mine was always firearms and I collect guns and, and I go shooting Brent Muscat and I both collect guns and are big avid firearms collectors. And um, so I started thinking, well, what am I going to do? And then it's naturally you start going, well, what do I like to do? Well, you know, I, I, I like firearms um, I, I used to take Krav Maga, it's like Israeli martial arts. And so I just was like, well, what kind of job can I tie my hobbies into a job? And also what kind of job can you do when you're used to like getting an adrenaline rush and a huge kick out of getting in front of 20,000 people every night. Sure. And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll fucking, I'll go find some really dangerous job where I'm fucking getting called, you know, to go to a house while the burglar alarm is going off and meet the guys he's coming out the window with a TV set and I'll get into it with him <laughs> because that'll be a fucking huge rush. Why not do that? Put my life on the line. <laughs> so, be like a superhero. Great. 
Well, you know, as crazy as it sounds, that's what I did, man. I was like, well, I looked into it. You know, I, I, I took the classes. I got certified uh, to carry a gun, and I got, you know, I got some serious training in, in, in tactical long rifle and, and firearms and and some more, you know, hand-to-hand stuff. And um, and uh, at the time, you know, even uh, at, in 2009, I was kind of too old to apply for, like, LAPD or something. But there's also all kinds of private security companies that are really basically cops, but in a private way. You still drive a patrol car. I still wore a bulletproof vest and carried a Glock 9 millimeter, And, and uh, I just buzzed my hair off and started working out all the time. And, you know, and, and uh, like everything else I do, I got into it 110%. And for probably four years at least, it was. Uh, uh, yeah, man, I drove a patrol car five days a week. And I can routinely would get called to fights at hotels or burglar alarms or robberies in progress. And we worked closely with LAPD and, um, and I know it probably <laughs> sounds like a total fucking nut, but I, I had a blast, man. It was, it was, uh, a huge adrenaline rush that goes without saying, but, uh, it was, you know, I mean, it, it honestly was so good at times to help people, you know, I mean, when you, when you get called to a, you know, an apartment and there's an old lady and her house is on fire, and, you know, she's in her house and can't get out and you, you know, you help the fire department get her out or something. There's honestly a feeling at the end of the day, like, you know, I'm actually doing something that fucking matters, you know? And, uh, so yeah, I did that for four years and, um, and then, you know, you eventually like, rock and roll called me back. I was say, you were like it the rock and roll Batman. <laughs> that's a funny way to put it man that's kind of funny but I, I mean I guess I guess it's true to a certain extent you know it, it's funny because I mean eventually rock and roll called me back and you know I missed it and I came back to it and I'll probably never leave it again but I had to get away and, and that's what I did but what's funny is like I used to drive down Sunset Boulevard and I would drive past the rainbow or the whiskey and I would laugh to myself because I was I would think to myself I bet you nobody fucking that I'm driving past right now has any idea who's in this car and even if they right. saw me they probably wouldn't even know who i was because you know i had a hat on and my hair was all buzzed real short and and i was like you know they wouldn't even probably know me if uh <laughs> if they <laughs> saw me but you know again fame is still all, all around me i you know i get a call one night about a bunch of burglar alarms going off at a house and i go flying up to this house in a really nice part of hollywood and it's Doc Rivers, the coach of the LA Clippers, and I, and, you know, and, and you know, you don't walk up to somebody's door while and knock on the door while the burglar alarm's going off. I, you know, they give you the code. You you sneak down the side of the house. You come up on the kitchen, and there's this domestic scene of Doc Rivers and his wife and his kids having dinner. And you know, it's like I'm knocking on the glass door and going, "Hey, you know, you're, you know, we got a call that you know your alarms have been tripped." But still, it's like, you know, I, I'm a huge sports fan, a big basketball fan, and I'm, I didn't say anything to him, but I'm thinking, holy fucking shit, here we go again. Doc Rivers, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I, when but, I told the other guys I mean, that night, I'm like, <laughs> anyway, go ahead, yeah. I, I was going to say, like, but how was, I mean, that's like a, a wild situation, like, where you're going from, you know, being a, a musician, touring musician, um, to go in and get a job to where you're get now getting a paycheck, like a weekly paycheck. Like how, I mean, that's kind of like, is it kind of like a mind fuck? I mean, you know what I mean? Like it's a total reality check or something. I don't even know how to put it. Well, it's kind of weird. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, it, 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 I mean, let alone it's weird in the fact that you're collecting a regular check, but you're still getting your quarterly royalties from ASCAP for record sales and you're still getting those checks. So in a way you're kind of like, doubling your income hopefully the irs right. isn't listening to this interview but <laughs> you know that's, that's another thing speaking of the irs it's like you know i'll still i'm always a rock and roller so it's like you know I'm, I'm making a regular check but it's still like somebody has to tell me you know it's important to do your taxes and all this shit because you know you're used to business managers and whatnot but um i don't think it's that much of a mind fuck i mean it's just a nice thing to have a regular check that you can rely on where rock and roll is so up and down and you know, hit and miss one, one year you're doing well. Another year it's, it's a little bit, you know, it's, you know, you're hurting a little bit, whatever. But I mean, I, I've always gotten my royalty checks that come in and still do and all that shit. But, um, you know, it was, I mean, it was, a, you know, it wasn't a huge amount, but it was a decent amount for sure. I mean, you know, uh, they got to pay you a decent amount to do what you're doing. Shit. Lord knows. 
if you're going to get fucking shot and killed, you better be getting a decent check. Um, but right. uh, I don't. I wouldn't call it a mind fuck. I mean, it was just you know, it's it was. I, I kind of really never thought about. It. I just had direct direct deposit, and the money went in, and it was always there, and it was good, and it was um, nice to have a regular check for a few years because you know when you do leave that and go back into rock and roll, it's right back to no paycheck and it's right back to, you know, this year you've got a great gig um, next month. Who knows what the fuck you're doing, you know? So right. that, that, that can be rough at times. Wasn't it, um, wasn't it Brent who, um, after pussycat and all, he ended up working at Starbucks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, after, you know, when we, we were out on the second KISS tour, when we got the word that we were dropped by Elektra, and for all of us, it was like, you know, I mean, for all of us, no one excluded it. It was like, you know, you know, for eight years, you're on tour, and you're selling records, and your rent's always paid, and business managers are taking care of your bills, and, and then you're on tour with KISS on your second tour when, you know, your manager contacts you and says hey you know uh, you enjoy the tour while it lasts you guys got dropped by electra you know this is it it's over <laughs> you know and and the reality when you come you know when it ends i mean yeah i think i got into it with you a little last time where i i immediately flew to baltimore and started a band with brian damage from kicks and just tried right. to jump right into another band because that's what i knew how to do but sure. you know for everybody the the cold hard reality was you know Faster Pussycat was, you know, the whole scene had changed. Seattle was, grunge was huge, and the glam thing was dead. And it wasn't, I think it was not just Faster Pussycat, but a lot of people at the time were faced with, you know, unless you were lucky enough to be like GNR and sell a zillion records, you know, the reality was, what are you going to fucking do? You've got to pay your bills and pay your rent. And, and for a lot of people, after doing that for so long, it's it's a fucking slap in the face, you know. So, um, yeah, when I heard Brent was working at Starbucks, I mean, I you know, I'm, who am I to say anything? You know, everybody does what they have to do. I mean, there was a while um, there where I was playing in a band and working at my dad's printing company. I mean, you know, you just do what you got to do. And um, that's part of rock and roll, man. That's part of the tenacity if you want to be in the business. Unless you're in a band like the Stones or something, there's or, or Motley Crue or GNR or whatever. I mean, unless you're fortunate enough to have that kind of consistent income for enough years, um, there's going to be great times and there's going to be tough times. And you, you know, you got to just do what you got to do. So, you know, yeah, I I wouldn't. You know, that's what he did for a while. And I know I know Greg was doing TV production for a while. I think I heard he was making some decent money for a while. And um, you know, so everybody did what they had to do. Sure. Know. Yeah, unfortunately. So if Eric, <laughs> Eric, Eric Stacy gets the chance to sit down and put together his uh, his uh, solo band or his new um, band that he wants to work with, um, who are, who are the people that you would like to be working with right now? Man, why did I know that? As soon as you started that question, I go, he's going to ask me, who would I like to put together? What would be a dream lineup? Um, gosh, and, I, and I don't mean like know, Keith that's... Richards or Randy Rhodes or somebody like that. I, I mean I mean people that are out there right now, you know, work, work, trying right. to, well, you know. Um, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Um, well, um, uh, well, you know, when you say, well, I don't mean Keith Richards, it, it's funny because, like, at first on drums I would say I would probably, like, grab somebody like a Steven Adler because I just think as a drummer he has that feel like I think Mark Michaels the original drummer for uh, Faster and Steven Adler were similar players and for me as a bass player um, their their groove is like I just I fit their pocket I can feel their style just mm -hmm. really well so um, but then but then I was starting to think well I'd actually grab Joey Kramer on drums because he's the original pocket drummer but then you said well no one well it doesn't need to be like Keith Richards and I was like well then maybe Joey Kramer's out because Aerosmith they ain't the Stones but they're pretty big but um, I mean you know I would grab I mean on drums it would if I if I could ideally go out and pick somebody on drums I mean it would be somebody like a Steven Adler or a Matt Sorum or I mean uh 
Um, actually, it was funny. That just brought up another memory. Me and Matt Sorum, um, for like a moment in time, played an E.G. Daly's band together. I don't know if you remember E.G. Daly, the actress. but um, <laughs> She just did the show a couple yeah. weeks ago, or actually a couple months ago. And actually, she? I was just emailing with her the other day. She'll be back on next month. Oh, right on, right on. I don't even know if she'd remember, but I remember because it was like coming to her first rehearsal. She had a fur coat on and had her little puppy in her hands. And, uh, yeah, yeah Matt was playing drums and, and I was playing bass. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, but, yeah, so uh, I definitely like somebody like a Steven Adler. I just love their style on drums. Um, How about like a Tommy Lee? Hard to think. Uh, Tommy Lee would another great drummer, you know, he would be another, yeah, fuck yeah, another awesome drummer who's a great pocket drummer. Definitely, Tommy Lee would be a great drummer. Um, on guitar, there's one guy I would I would definitely go to who I've actually played with already, who I think is, is like one of the best guitar players who some people know it already and some people may not know it, but Brian Damage from Kicks is nice. like in my opinion, one of the friggin' best guitar players. He can play blues. He can play rock. He's been playing for a long time. He's just a friggin' awesome guitar player. Um, I'll tell you what, if I could do a record, I'd definitely grab Billy from Jet Boy 2 to play on it. He's a fucking great guitar player. Um, you know, I'd probably grab Brian and Billy and Tommy Lee and Steven Adler and, um, yeah, you know, um, it's so hard to just pick a band, you know, I, it's, I understand why when people do solo records, they have different people on different tracks. Cause sure. I think probably what I'd have to do is, you know, yeah. So, but that's, that's some names I would definitely go after, you know, I hope about, that answers um, the question. <laughs> how about, have you ever played with about, uh, Tracy guns? I've jammed with him. Yeah. He's a gr another great guitar player, another really good guitar player, you know, and he, he's, he's, uh, um, it's funny cause a lot of people know him as from LA guns, but he, he can, you know, he's got all that Randy Rhodes shit down oh, and, yeah. and he's a super fucking talented guitar player. Yeah. No doubt about it. You know? Um, yeah, he's, you know, I, I, yeah, definitely. I've jammed with him. Um, you know, where we've just been at, you know, where faster and elegance have been at, you know, at radio things together and gotten up and jammed or whatever. But, um, yeah, he's, he's another guy that I, I would certainly have on a record. Another great guitar player for sure. That's why, you know, it's so hard to pick one guy. Cause it's like, I mentioned Brian damage. Then you mentioned Tracy guns. I'm like, yep, there's another guy. And, and I bet you could <laughs> probably mention guys for about an hour and I'd go, yeah, I'd have him, <laughs> you know, <laughs> There's 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 some good players out there for sure, man. Um, I'm trying to think like the vocals who, who would be a tough think, one. Yeah. That's that's you know that's yeah that's the hardest one of all. You know that's always the hardest position, obviously. I mean, I I I would I would definitely you know I mean I would have Tammy come down and sing on a couple songs just because uh, I you know I've always loved Tammy's style. Um, who else would I have down? God, I, you know, fucking obviously would love to have Axel. I mean, who wouldn't love a guy that, you know, has like a four or five octave range and is, a, is that amazing of a talent? I would love to have him sing if I could have anybody I wanted, um, for sure. Um, fuck, I'd love to have Brian Johnson sing on a few tracks. Um, uh, yeah, there's, I guess those would be some of the vocalists I'd start to go after. It, definitely, it would definitely be a fucking killer record, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, man, cool. for sure. Yeah. So this, this, this has been another uh, another awesome interview. We almost did two hours. I know. I, it's funny. I just looked at my watch, and I'm like, is it really, like, have we been on for an hour and 45 minutes? It's funny, but we have. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you. It always is, man. You know, you ask great questions. I love talking to you. It's just the time flies by, you know, it's fun. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's crazy. Cause I, and I said earlier how, uh, you know, I seen you guys, uh, open for Alice Cooper and then I, you know, going through the whole thing. Like I, you guys played, uh, you played the tower theater, uh, two nights in a row with Alice Cooper. Uh huh. And I was yeah. there for those. And, uh, uh -huh. I remember you know, that. it's crazy. Actually, the second night, um, 
I left right after your guys set, and Tammy came like running through the crowd afterwards, and me and my buddies like chased them, and um, <laughs> you, you guys were all the way. You guys were already in the bus, and you guys were. I think you guys ended up going to the Empire or something that night to see Cinderella play or something, or Britney Fox. Right. Uh huh. And um, yeah, I was. I had my car like parked right around the corner, and I had my album in there. So I ran out and got my album, and he, he got it, and he signed it, and he brought it on the bus, and all you guys signed it for me, and then you guys were gone. <laughs> I was like, all right. Cool. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Cool. Well, that was nice of Jamie. Yeah, cool, man. I do remember those shows. I, you, you know, last time I talked to you, you threw me for a spin, like that first show. You're like, do you remember the Empire when you guys played with Frankie? And I was like, I kind of do, but I do remember the Tower Theater. I do remember those shows. They were taped for... Japanese TV program. You can still find those shows on YouTube. And uh, I think one, I, I, you know what I remember? It was like a rainy night. It was like one of one of the nights. It was a rainy yeah. night, and I remember, I remember seeing the marquee in a, on a rainy night, saying "Faster Pussycat" and Alice Cooper. And I remember it had the curtain drawn halfway across the stage, and we were set up against the curtain. And yeah, I remember those shows very well. That, those were some good shows, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, that was fun. That was fun. I always loved playing Philly. You know, always had a great time. We played there with Kiss and Motley. And Philly's one of those weird cities because it's like, you know, the the arenas are out kind of like out way outside of downtown, and it's like you got the arenas, and then you got downtown Philly where all the hotels are, and it's nice. But to get from point A to point B, you have to go through like a friggin' war zone. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember that about Philly. <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah! Oh yeah! That's funny. yeah. Now, a very what, rock and roll town. Was the kiss? Was it was it the Hot in the Shade tour? It was. You know, I was just talking to somebody the other day. We did two back to back, and it was it was either the Hot in the Shade tour, or the one right after that. What was the one that that Forever was off of? Hot in the Shade. Hot in the Shade. Yes. And then what was the one right after it or before it when they had that like? Well, I used to call it the gorilla face, but it was really a pyramid behind them. Or was that hot? Yeah, in the that shade? was hot in the shade. That's hot in the shade. Okay, what was the one right before it or after it? Maybe start with a P or something or a F. There was a tour like two years before it or after it because we toured with them in '90 and we toured with them again in '92, I believe. I think after that was that. Revenge. Okay, I'm sorry, not a P, R. I think it was Revenge. I think we did Hot in the Shade and, and Revenge, I believe. One was with Eric Carr and one was with Eric Singer. Okay. So, and I think we did Philly, I want to say maybe both tours we did Philly, uh, but I, I know for sure we did uh, we did one night, because I'll never <laughs> I'll never forget that like Tammy wasn't feeling well that night. And uh, they had the stage on that. You know, there's that screen above the center court of the basketball arena where you can look up and see your face like 50 feet tall, whether you like it or not. And right. I remember Tammy wasn't feeling well that night. And he was just like hawking loogies and had this look on his face all night like, I'm, I'm ready to throw up. Let's get, you know, let's try to get through this. And I remember at one point looking up on the screen and seeing his face like five feet, like five stories tall, like hawking loogies and just pissed off and, and and not feeling well, and I, I just, I don't know, I just remember that, looking up and kind of laughing, and chuckling at that, that was really funny, but that was, that was, I think it was the show, I think it was the tour after Hot in the Shade, the one with uh, Eric Singer, if I remember right. Yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think it was the Hot in the Shade tour, I saw, because I know I saw, I saw you guys on the Dr. Feelgood tour, and then it, it must mm-hmm. have been the Revenge tour. It must have been. It must have been the Revenge Tour. Philly was just one of those cities we always hit, and I know I, I know we hit it with Kiss on one of those tours, um, and we always, you know, we always obviously with the big shows we always hit that same. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the arena now. I don't even think if I think they rebuilt it. They might. Did they yeah, tear they down the old it, like uh, the Spectrum? Yeah, where this. Right, that's it. The Spectrum. That's where we used to always play, where the Sixers played and shit. And the flyers. Yeah, it's I think, now. It's too. literally now a, a piece of grass. Really? Yeah. Holy shit! God, that's yeah. so weird. So many of those places we used to play aren't aren't the big places aren't around anymore. That's that's the no. case in so many places. You know, I think they did that to like even some of the 
like big outdoor stadiums we used to play, they just, they're gone, man. <laughs> you know, they're all like, gone. I remember, yeah, I was talking to somebody recently. I was going, yeah, we played, we, I don't remember where I was, but I go, yeah, we played there. And he's like, yeah, man, it's a parking lot now. And I'm like, yep. oh, well, <laughs> bummer, you know. I don't know. I guess whatever corporation, big business. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, it's 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 a bummer. And it, you know, in some respects, some of those places it sucks because, you know, like in L.A., the Forum. Thank God that's still around. Because as you know, as a kid, I used to go see fucking Lakers games there, and I saw so many concerts there. Ozzy, Def Leppard, on and on and on. And and then, you know, when Motley Crue, when we were out with the crew on Doctor Feelgood, it was like this was my hometown and the arena that I had seen so many things go on. And so, to go on two nights in a row to a packed forum was was an honor and a bitchin' thing. And and um, sure. I'm so glad they didn't. You know, when the Lakers and Kings left, I'm so glad they didn't tear that place down. It's kind of like making a revival. And now the Rams are back, so they're building a stadium next door or a football stadium. But uh, thank God the forum's still around because that place has so many great shows that have happened in those hollowed, hollowed halls with the stones and um you know so it sucks when you see some of those old arenas get torn down it's it's it's, it's kind of a bummer you know it dude it's totally like all like i i'm so into like all them old like arenas and stadiums and all and um actually i was the day they announced that they were going to be knocking down the spectrum that night the food fighters were playing there and i went and saw them and Dave Grohl had brought up about them knocking it down and all, like before their their last song. And I sat there, and when they were the last song was "Best of You," and I was crying like a baby. And I, I, me and my buddy are there, and I'm just looking at my buddy, and I'm crying. He's like, "What's the matter?" I'm like, "Dude, they're going to knock the spectrum down." <laughs> Dude, I can totally relate. That's how I am too. You know. I'm a I'm a big emotional fucking teddy bear. I mean, like if if fucking Foo Fighters were doing the best of you in, in the stadium, I grew up seeing so much shit and was getting torn down. I'd be fucking sitting there bawling my eyes out too, man. You know, <laughs> like it's, I could see it, man. It's 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 it like you. I'm I'm into all those old stadiums. I'm a big sports fan. I mean, you know, the stories could go on and on, and we've been on forever. But I mean, we played the Palace in Detroit where the Pistons played. Not that it had that much history to it, but. I mean, I remember walking off stage after we were open for Motley and bumping into Dennis Rodman at the bottom of the ramp and meeting him and hanging out with him all night and getting to be friends with him. And just like, you know, just all, 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 all the, you know, you play all those big basketball arenas and, 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 and especially if you're a sports fan and in a rock and roll band, they, they take on a different meaning. I mean, we played Boston Garden, the original Boston Garden with Alice Cooper. And it was like, I was a huge Laker fan, you know, so it was, I, it was such an honor to trash the dressing room where I where I knew the Celtics <laughs> used to get ready. I fucking fucked that room up as bad as I could in honor of the Lakers and watching oh, Jack Nicholson cool. sit in like the 290th row during the championship, you know. Um, and yeah, my manager wasn't too happy about it when we got the bill. But, um, you know, I mean, that was like when, you know, you find out Boston Gardens torn down and after, it's, you just feel fortunate to have played the original arena, you know. Sure, sure. You know, yeah, to be able to say I played Boston Garden and shit like that is like it's very cool. It was weird. Like uh, I actually, uh, the Christ, it was I think it was called the Fleet Center that first year the new Boston building opened, and uh, me yeah. and my wife yeah. and my cousins and all we all we took a ride up to see a Flyers game up there, and um, the the Boston Garden was still standing at the time, and I remember they literally built them. So so close together, like I couldn't even fit my body between the two. It was amazing how close together those two buildings were. I believe it. I I I haven't seen it. I don't know if I even seen the new Fleet Center, but I believe it. And what's really weird is if you remember, Boston Garden was built under like the subway station, you know. Right. So to have them like right up against each other like that is like you know. I mean, I could see it. I could see it. You know, there's not a lot of use of space in Boston with all the buildings, and it's not a big town, but yeah, I mean, that's one of the old legendary stadiums, you know, of all time. I mean, when I went to Berkeley College of Music in, in 80 or 81, whatever it was, I mean, I, I went to Boston Garden to see Van Halen on the Women and Children First Tour, you know. I mean, it was just like, yeah, you know, so when when those places come down, it's, you know, you, you're, a, you, you know, you're sad for it, but, you you know, you also, it's kind of cool to be able to say, yeah, you know, I played 
the spectrum and I played Boston garden and the forum and it's, 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 you know, it's just another cool thing that you got to do. Um, I'll tell you of all the places that got torn down though, not, it wasn't even arena, but my biggest heartbreak was when they tore the Starwood down, the original Starwood down. I was so sad. I went down there and I got a brick from it out of the debris when they, when the wrecking ball took it, you know, went to the Starwood and, um, yeah, that for me that was the the, the heartbreaker of all heartbreakers. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I could I could see yeah. that. I mean, I, totally. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, for somebody that grew up there every night, and that's where they began their rock and roll life, and knew everybody that worked there. Um, you know, I definitely made sure I went down there and got a brick from the original Starwood, and I still have it. You know, and. I found a phone list in the wreckage and it still had the names and extensions. And I knew those people, you know, some, some of them right. are dead now, you know, and I still have it. And, um, you know, I mean, it's not an arena, but it's just, you know, that's, I mean, for me growing up in LA, that's part of what sucks about LA is you look around now and so much of original LA and Hollywood and the clubs you played are, are gone. And, right. um, you know, there's nothing you can do but move on. But I mean, you know, like I said, I'm like you, I'm a sentimental guy. It sucks. It, it, you know, it hurts to see shit like that go away. Now, what's there now in its place? Oh my God, that's even worse than the fucking place being torn down. You know, you go there now, and it's like, it's like just one of those modern mini malls that you drive in, and it's got a freaking flower place and a, a, a UPS store, and you know, it's just. It's oh, like this nondescript, like a million other just places that you just drive in, and it's just, it is what it, you know, it's just, it's nothing. It's just, it's just another friggin' mini mall, and it, yeah, it's so sad because man, I was somebody, thank God, opened a did a Facebook page on the Starwood, and I and and you know said, hey, you know, I put you on the page and. They, they, people post old pictures and, you know, you remember like the marquee that you used to have to drive under. And I remember seeing Aerosmith as Dr. JJ and the interns and, um, seeing Blondie there in 78 and all those bands. And, um, so, you know, for, for me, when that thing went down, it was like, it was like losing a member of the family, honestly. Wow. Yeah. 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 It's, just, yeah. it's you know, it sucks. It really sucks, and same thing with the arenas, man. So, but you and, know, and, you know p- places like I mean, like the Starwood, and I mean, there's still like the whiskey and stuff like that. But like, it's hard to come across like, uh, you know, anywhere in the country anymore, like a club like that that's got such history that's still a cool place to go to. You know, there's there's I don't know if there's any around anymore. I mean. When I when Faster broke up in '93, I think it was, I moved to New York for a couple of years, and I was there from '93 to '95. Uh, like I said, playing with Ricky Bird, we had a band, the Bird Dogs, and I got to play CBGBs with the Bird Dogs, and that's another you know club where it was like I'm so like happy to have played the original CBGBs, you know, where the Ramones and you know and Johnny Thunders and and and, and Television and all these bands and Patti Smith came out of. I mean to have gotten to play clubs like that, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's part of that thing where you see bands coming up these days and every now and then you'll see a band that, that thinks they're all that. And they're, they think that, you know, their sound is great and that they're all so cool. And, and, you know, you don't say anything, but you think to yourself, dude, if you only fucking had a clue, if you only really knew, you know, and it's like, that's part of it. It's like, you know, those those clubs and that history and and stuff. I mean, like you said, the all those clubs are gone. I mean, there was one in San Francisco, the Keystone, that everybody grew up in San Francisco remembers, and the Starwood and and, and CBGBs, and and they're all gone, man. It's, um, I mean, I hate to bum people out. <laughs> <It just sucks. laughs> you know, you're I bringing mean, us down, Eric. You're bringing us down. People. I know. I know. I hate to be like people are going to be like, well, that was great until the end. Where now I want to fucking go kill myself. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I, you know, it, it, it just it is what it is. I mean, fuck, life moves on. But I'm just glad I got to play all those places. Crazy, 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 crazy. Yeah. 
It is, man. It is. Well, <laughs> craziness was all around us, huh? Absolutely. Fame was always around <laughs> you, actually. Not us, you. <laughs> the, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, Eric, I, I mean, uh, I, I guess I got to, like, give you major thank yous again for tonight. <laughs> this has been awesome. No problem. No problem, man. Like I said, you know, when I talk to you, and yeah, it's been two hours, but I don't even really think of us doing a radio show right now. I just think of me talking to you, you know, that's how it is. And so it's, you know, it's always good to talk to you and, you know, I'm always available for you. You know that. So absolutely, yeah, man, anytime. Yeah. Anytime. Yeah, see, I, I'm going to tell you, you need to come out here to Philly because you can probably get out here to Philly a lot quicker than, than I'll get out here to Vegas. All right. I'd love to come out and see you, man. It's been a while since I've been out to Philly, you know. You have to uh, take me around show me what's going on there now, man. It's been a while, but yeah, man. There's nothing going on here. <laughs> you know, there's nothing going on here. Don't come out here. <laughs> you know, I'll come out, and that's out there what... and go, I'm here, Bay, and you'll be all, there's nothing here, man. What did you come out for? <laughs> you know, I shouldn't say that because, I mean, there is actually, like, a lot. They opened, like, a lot of clubs around here. But, like, for the, like, the hard rock scene or metal scene, it's, like, non-existent. It, it's just... Is the, Empire, is the Empire Ballroom still around? Oh, no, no. That closed um, probably within a year to two after you guys played there. Really? Fuck, that long yeah, ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's now... Wow. If it... It was... The last thing I think it was, I think it still is, is, like, a furniture store. Oh my god! Yeah, that sounds right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. That sounds right. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, nonetheless, Philly's a great town, and uh, had a lot of great times there. I mean, you know, I and it's a, it's a close drive to New York too. So you know, um, yeah. Whenever I, when I lived in New York, I used to drive out to Philly all the time, and so uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's a great town. I'll make it out there one day. I'll see you, you know. One of or if you days. come out to Vegas, you know. Yeah, fuck yeah, absolutely. Anytime, man. Right on. You know that. Yeah, cool. anytime, brother. Definitely. Well, you got to keep us uh, keep us up to date with, uh, with the, uh, the book and the, uh, the solo album and the new project and everything else that you're going on and uh, the more fame that keeps popping up around you and, you know. Absolutely. I will. You know that. I mean, we always, you know, you and I always stay in touch and text and email. And I always keep you up to date and stuff. I'll let you know. I mean, there will be some good stuff coming up for sure. I don't plan on solely doing Jet Boy. There's definitely going to be some cool stuff I'm, I'm going to make happen. And uh, I'll always keep in touch with you and let you know what's going on for sure. One last thing I wanted to mention is I do have a fan club, Base Cats, Friends, and Felines. And anyone who wants to reach out to me through private message or whatever, I'll send them info on that. I got a lot of good, you know, people that have joined that really dig it. And you get shirts and stickers and pictures and sticks and so. Nice. Yeah. Good stuff. Cool. Yeah, man. For right, sure. Yeah, man. We'll, yeah. we'll be talking. And, uh, yeah, dude, thank you again for so much. This is uh, two hours of uh, Eric Stacy fame and music. Got to love it. Yeah, you got it. Like I said, anytime. You know that, for sure. Thanks, yeah. man. I appreciate that. You got it. You take care, Bay. It was great talking to you. You too, man. Be talking soon. All right. Sounds good. Speak to you soon, buddy. Take care. Right. See ya. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right, well, there he goes. Eric friggin' Stacy. That was two hours. Two hours and two minutes. Nick. Come up with some ideas for tonight because we only have one guest. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, too funny. That was awesome. It was. It was good. A lot of good stuff in there. A lot of dirt he, he, uh, he exposed. Yeah, no, he had more than a few great stories. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do if you walked into a bar in Tokyo and Christopher Lloyd sitting there? You end up going out and partying with him. Yeah, no, that, I, I, the same exact thing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Oh. Yeah, I, I can see the pr- this press release tomorrow. I'll be right writing up. 